good afternoon to everybody and greetings from London. I thought that what I would try and share with you today is something I hope that you will be able to appreciate no matter what conditions or disorders that you're interested in. So I thought that what I would try to do would be to use autism as an example of some of the progress we're making and some of the difficulties that we're finding. But I want to stress that this is just one example and that the methods that we use can be applied to any condition or any disorder. So whether you are interested in psychosis or depression or anxiety or ADHD or whatever it is. So what I'm going to talk about today firstly is things called biomarkers and why we need them. So many of you probably think, why on earth do I need to know about biomarkers? That's not going to impact on my practice at all. But actually, I hope to show you that, um, in fact, I think we are within reach of them impacting on practice. So I'll show you why we need them. And then I'll give you a pretty boring bit about some definitions that you might want to hold in your mind. And then I'll talk to you a little bit about how it is we're trying to make progress in a European context. So this slide is what we call a very busy slide. So in other words, there is a lot going on in it. And I make no apologies for that because this reflects the state of play of current treatments in autism. So as you'll be aware, there are no treatments which are active, active pharmacological treatments at the moment for the core symptoms of autism. There are some approved treatments, for example, in terms of aggression within autism, but none for the core symptoms themselves. And those things which are, have been approved are major tranquilizers, so um, antipsychotics. But what you see here on this page is the different kinds of medications that are used in individuals with autism. Across the bottom here, you'll see the different countries. So France, Germany, Italy, Spain, the UK, Japan, USA, Canada, Mexico, and Brazil. Unfortunately, we didn't have information for Egypt. But what you will see across all those different countries is huge variation in the types of medications that are used. The different colors mean different medications. And on the top of the slide is individuals who are above the age of 19. And on the bottom of the slide is individuals beneath the age of 19. So the take home message here is that although we lack effective treatments, we are still using treatments for which there is no evidence base and that usage varies massively across different countries. So why is it that we have no effective treatments for core symptoms of autism? And also, why is it that we've not been able to develop new treatments for things like schizophrenia? We have treatments, but they're what we call me true treatments, me too treatments, in other words, they're just the same as the treatments that went before them. For those of you who think, say, for example, who are interested in ADHD, if you think, oh, that's not true in ADHD, we have lots of effective treatments. That's actually not the case. Because approximately 40% of people with ADHD have a suboptimal response. So why is it, why are we so bad at getting these new treatments? So there are a number of reasons. Firstly, in terms of discovering new treatments, we really don't understand too much about the underpinning biological mechanisms. That's the first thing. The second thing is that there's a poor translation from the laboratory to the clinic. In other words, lots of the animal and cellular models are not that great. And then even if we get something through that process, we then run our trials. But those trials use a thing 
called an all-comers approach. In other words, they just include everyone within the trial, independent of what their biology is. And I'll come on to that in a second if I can. The next thing is we have massive placebo effects. And for example, we're just about to publish a paper in the Lancet Psychiatry in a randomized controlled trial in which we show that there were more adverse events in the placebo arm than in the active drug arm. And there were more self-rated problems within the placebo arm than in the active drug arm. So we have massive placebo effects. The next thing is in trial design, we often have one rater at the beginning of the trial and another at the end. So you get inconsistency in opinion. And last but not least, is we rely on the feedback of our patients reporting how they're feeling. We're, but we don't have any objective measures, for example, of how much you are socializing or how anxious you are. Those are not currently included within clinical trials. Last but not least, obviously, we have the cultural aspects such as stigma. So relatively little work goes on in discovery of new treatments within mental health conditions as compared to, say, cancer. And also some of the things which really impact on individuals, no matter what your primary disorder, are what we call associ associated symptoms. So, for example, if you have psychosis, you'll often have co-occurring depression or ADHD, co-occurring anxiety. In autism, co-occurring depression and anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder. Yet we often, and these are often the symptoms which most impact on patients, but yet we know relatively little about them and there are very few trials in that area. So this is what I mean by a heterogeneous disorder. So currently, we call autism, we use the umbrella term for autism, just like ADHD or psychosis. But within autism, there's many different biologies which make up autism. And so if you bring everyone into a trial, giving them the same compound, you're not going to address the same biology in everybody. And this is what I mean by that. So we need to split them into much more homogeneous subgroups to be effective. So on the top of this slide, you'll see that group of individuals, let's call it autism, it could be ADHD, and you'll see their biologies. Each individual has got a, a different biology, but yet what happens in a trial is we offer them, say, this green tablet. But we would expect that green tablet only to be effective in those people who have green, right? And it would be less effective in those individuals who are a mixture of green and other colors. And it might even lead to an adverse effect in the people who have this blue biology. So we need to find a way to identify these individuals who have the green biology and are much more likely to respond. That's why we need biomarkers. So that we can give individualized treat, tailored approaches based upon the underlying biology. So that each of these individual groups of people can have an effective treatment. You'll see here the blue getting the blue tablet, the mix getting the mixed tablet, and the green getting the green tablet. And of course, another key to remember is that these treatments and biosignatures are likely to a change with age. So what may be an effective treatment in early childhood or a good, good biomarker in early childhood is likely not to be the same in older age. So what are biomarkers? And how can they make, help us make progress? And this is, if you've been bored already, 
I'm afraid that the next bit is even more boring. So here we are. This is what the biomarkers are. This is all you need to remember. Because you have a significant group difference, it doesn't mean you have a biomarker, okay? So just because on average one group is, say, taller than another, it doesn't mean you have a biomarker for, for example, height. What we really need is something which marks out the individual. And that's what I'm going to go on and show you now. So this is a little bit of statistics for you. And I, I apologize about that. But this is what I mean. If we do a classical case control design, you will see here an effect size of 0 0.5. Doesn't differentiate the two groups that well. It does on average. You get a mean group difference, but you don't get much ability to identify individuals or really how these differ as groups. When we get to an effect size of one, we're about getting there, but not quite. It's really when we have an effect size of 2.7 that we're really able to say most individuals with, say, autism or psychosis are different than the neurotypical control group. So remember that. Effect size of 0 0.5 to 1, not much good in terms of distinguishing large groups of individuals. And an effect size of 2.7 is about what you want. And if you look over here on the right-hand side of the slide, you'll see the effect sizes that we're currently reporting within autism. But the same is true also within psychosis and also within ADHD. So you'll see the very best effect sizes we're getting are at about one but most of them are down at around 0 0.5 and 0 0.4 so this is why we're having a difficulty that's the first thing and to put that more succinctly perhaps i'm going to put this in context for you if you look at the top of this slide you'll see a whole bunch of domains but let's just take this one for example the SWM stands for Spatial Working Memory. And here what we're doing is we're asking, on average, you know, is there a significant between group difference in people with autism and controls in their spatial working memory? And we find a massively significant difference as defined by the p-value. So that's 10 to the minus 8. That is just like the best p-value you could ever want, right? That is just like, goodness me, I've got a great discovery here. But when you actually then plot out, which is the next graph down here, all those individuals using what we call normative modeling, and we ask how far is each individual from the neurotypical performance that we would expect at that age, we find, this is B, okay, we find that actually 55% of people with autism perform within the normal range or even above as compared to their neurotypical control at the same age. And only about a third show deficits that could be of clinical significance. So bottom line, if you read in a journal or hear that something has a massively significant between group difference, it does not mean that it has clinical utility. And it does not mean that people you see within the clinic will be having problems in that domain. In fact, it's most likely that they wouldn't be having. They'd be about two-thirds likely to be performing within the normal range. So then what we need to do then is begin to use different statistical approaches to break down these large groups into subgroups and that relate then back to underlying biology. And if we do that, the purpose of that is to allow us to find these things we call biomarkers. And for the purposes of today, we're just going to talk very briefly about four of them. The first is a prognostic biomarker. And a prognostic biomarker means that something that I would develop in the laboratory that would allow you to use in the clinic to say to know what someone's likely outcome is going to be 
over the course of their life without any intervention. So that's someone's in your clinic, doctor, how am I going to do without any intervention? A predictive biomarker, on the other hand, is something which we hope would allow you in the clinic to say, this biosignature tells me how likely it is that you would or wouldn't respond to this intervention I'm going to give you. So that would change the kind of conversation you can have with your patient in the clinic. So you could say, using a prognostic biomarker, look, if you don't have an intervention, your likely outcome is going, to, is going to be good or it's going to be not so good. And if you then take this intervention, your likely outcome to that intervention is going to be good or not so good, however it is you define it. And the next type of risk biomarker is that which allows us to say what is your risk or likelihood of actually developing a disorder if you currently don't have one? So that would be, say, for example, you would be a middle adolescent and in an at-risk population for psychosis. The question then would be, what's the risk of that individual, likelihood of that individual then go on to develop psychosis in later adolescence? Or likewise, you're an infant, you have a family history of autism or ADHD, what is the likelihood of you as an infant subsequently being diagnosed as having autism or ADHD? So to solve that, as you'd expect, is a really complex problem. And the European Union has put large amounts of money in and said that to solve this, we need to have academics working together with industry. And so what we did was we put in a proposal to the European Union called EU Aims. And we said, look, to make progress, we need to bring together experts across Europe in different disciplines, in great universities and also industry. And we need to move away from people just doing work on cellular assays or just doing work on animal models or just doing work in the clinic we need to bring all this together so that progress in one area informs progress in another area. So by working together, we can make better progress. And this was our design. We brought together four clinical cohorts, which are probably of most interest to you. They are of infants who are at risk of developing autism because they have a family history of autism. We have individuals here between the ages of 6 and 30 who have autism. And we then follow them up for five years. The same with the infants. We also have individuals who have genetic risks for autism defined as they're carrying a copy number variant, a genetic variant associated with autism. Or they have a synaptic gene deficit, which puts them at risk of autism. And we do what's called deep phenotyping. So each of those individuals would come in, they would undergo imaging, EEG, cognitive behavioral measures, genotyping, biofluid measures. And the idea then being, can we identify core biologies within subgroups that we can then target? And can we develop biomarkers that are going to be useful in the clinic? So I will tell you about the progress we made in a few slides time. But what I am going to tell you is that there were some, although we were very productive, there were some things we were missing in that prior study. And so we were fortunate to get follow-on funding to include these other groups. So you may recall that in my last slide, I showed you that we started with high-risk infants. But actually, we need to go earlier than that, and we need to study babies during pregnancy. Now, to reassure you, the purpose of this is not to identify biological abnormalities in fetuses so that those pregnancies could be terminated. 
That is not the purpose. The purpose here is to identify whether are there are biologies that we can detect that allow us to interrogate how genetic risk interacts with environmental risk. So you'll remember that we have the high-risk infants, and then in the last study, we started with children aged six and going up to young adulthood. Well, what we were missing out on was the preschoolers between the ages of three to six. So we've now included those in a new cohort. We also didn't have enough individuals with intellectual disability or individuals with epilepsy. So we've now included those individuals. So now our work spans from fetal time points through to age 30, and we're following up those individuals for five years. And another key thing that we've done is we work very closely with the regulators so that they can tell us whether what we're doing meets their requirements so that if we do find a biomarker or a new treatment, we know that we're going to have done the work in a way that's acceptable to regulators and so we can get it into the clinic far quicker. So let me give you some progress we've made then. Firstly, in EEG. Secondly, in MRI and PET. And thirdly, in functional imaging. And hopefully what I'll demonstrate to you is that Although you may not, say, for example, have MRI or PET or functional MRI in your clinical settings, you, you should have EEG, I would hope, or within your country access to EEG. So hopefully you may be able to see some potential relevance for your work in future in a clinical setting. So in this EEG work, we looked at 544 individuals. 303 with autism and 241 neurotypical controls. We used five centers, three different EEG systems. And the reason that's of importance is because what you don't want to find is something which relies on just having one EEG system. And what we studied was this thing called the N170. Now that is a EEG signature which is given in response to the way your face is presented. And that's of importance because, as you can see in this slide, what a body might be doing, for example, you see here Nancy Pelosi clapping Donald Trump, the face says something very different. And so the face conveys this unique information which impacts on our brain. And we need to see, can we get an EEG signature that and is it meaningful? Does it help us in any way understanding the biology? So this is what we found in this results of this N170. So the first thing we did was we found significant case control differences both in children, in adolescents, and in adults in what we call the N170 latency. So it's slower in individuals with autism. Now that's of importance because we're happy with that result because it replicates prior findings which have been shown in a meta-analysis. So we're confident that, that with the finding is going in the right direction. But the other thing that we found was that this N170 signal is really related to your brain biology and the amount that your brain responds to a face. So we've got this rope bust signal and that we know now relates to the core biology of face processing. So we're happy we've got a signal, we're happy we know what it means. Then what we ask is, well, so what? What use has that got? Well, if we look within autism, you'll see in the middle of this slide here, there's three boxes. And what this shows is three different subgroups of individuals with autism having different outcomes. So this green going up means a pretty good outcome. This blue going up means a, an okay but not great outcome. 
and this red going down means that's a poor outcome. And what we found in this red group was that that clustered together with a reduction in the N170. So in other words, we've got this group mean difference, but when we use that signal, we can now identify groups of individuals who are going to do poorly over the next 18 months in terms of their Vineland score, their Vineland social communication scores. And not only that, we didn't just find it at a group level, we also found it at an individual level. So there's a significant relationship with each individual's N170 and their outcome 18 months later. So where does that take us to? What we've now done is said, well, okay, what if we were to run a clinical trial and we enriched it for people who, who weren't going to get better or who, who were going to do relatively poorly and didn't bother running the trial in people who are going to do relatively well because they're the people who are going to give you the placebo response, right? Because they're going to do well anyway. And what we found was if we do that, we really reduce the amount of people that we need to include in our trial by about 30% to get a positive result. And that significantly reduces the cost of the trial and significantly increases our chances of finding an effective treatment. So I've now told you about EEG. I'll now briefly tell you about structural brain imaging. Now we've reported many, many times that there are significant differences in brain anatomy and that those differences in brain anatomy relate to the severity of your clinical sym symptoms. But the question is, do they relate to your outcome? And so I'm now going to show you the first pieces of work which show that yes, brain biology is associated with your outcome in a clinically meaningful way using change in the Vineland score over 18 months. And so in this study, we had 142 individuals and we had 78 who did relatively well and 64 who did relatively poorly as defined by their Vineland score and using clinically meaningful cutoffs. And what we found was significant differences at a group level between those who did well and those who did poorly. So brain biology assessed now is an 80% accurate predictor of what you're going to be like in 18 months time. Now that may potentially have clinical utility. The key word is may. Now I'm not saying it will, I'm saying it may. But then we can also ask as scientists, well, can we use that information to try and help us identify the underpinning mechanisms to how you do well or badly? And if so, does that help us design new treatments? And so what we've been able to do is to interrogate the genetic structure of those brain regions and identify particular genetic deficits which may be associated with the development of those regions which dictate whether you're doing well or whether you're doing poorly. And last but not least, functional imaging. What we've now shown is that if you are an autistic individual, you have got significant differences in brain resting functional connectivity. And we've now replicated this in four different cohorts of individuals in over 200,000 people, sorry, 20,000, 22,000 people, I do apologize, 2,000 people. So we have this robust finding of differences in functional connectivity, which just like the anatomy I've told you about, and just like the EEG I've told you about, are associated with variation in clinical symptomatology. Now that's in children and young adults. What are we, what's happening in the infants that we're studying? 
what we're able to do is also find similar but different functional connectivity differences in those infants who are at risk. And we're also finding very similar results in our fetal imaging from our very preliminary work. So what we're finding is differences in brain functional connectivity that are present in individuals who've been diagnosed with autism and very similar but slightly different in variation in functional connectivity is also present in at-risk infants. Well, you know, so what? Well, what can we do about that? And this shows you what we are doing to try and discover new treatments. What you see on the top of this slide is differences in task-based functional activation. And these are the differences between the controls and individuals with an autistic spectrum disorder. So at baseline, you'll see these differences in brain functional activation during, in this particular example, during a face processing task and inhibition tasks. But what we do is when we challenge them with a medication, in this particular example, we're reducing brain serotonin, we are able to abolish those case control differences. So this allows us then to say, we know the biology, we know there are differences. Can we get proof of concept that we can shift that biology with trial compounds? In other words, new compounds. And if we can get proof of concept that we can shift that biology, that gives us greater confidence to take those compounds into trial. And also makes us think about how we may be using this sort of technique within clinical settings to predict an individual's treatment response. So what have I said to you? This is the summary of what I've said to you today. We've now, I think, identified some of the biological associates of autism, and we've replicated those findings. I hope also what I've told you is of relevance to a numerous other conditions and disorders. So we, that's the first thing. The second thing is we've not just found differences. We found some of the mechanisms that likely underpin those differences. And the other thing that we have now shown is we've got proof of concept that we can modify those brain differences. And we've shown that in both rodents and in man. And I've shown you how we've worked together with our regulators to make sure that what we're doing fits their schemas so that we can then now take these into the clinic. And to that end, I can, I'm now happy to tell you that led by my colleague Celso Arango in Spain, we're now running our first clinical trials based on the information that we've gathered in this initial work. And we'll be launching a second trial starting in the first quarter of next year, which is, you know, very significant progress. I, of course, I can't say whether those trials will be successful or not. But what I can say is we've been able to make, I think, at least significant progress within a shorter period of time than if we had used traditional approaches. So last but not least, here's my take home message for you all today. If you've just got to remember one thing, just because you have a significant group difference does not mean you have something that is either clinically meaningful or allows you to have a biomarker that will have utility in either the clinic or in the research laboratory. And just to finish off, I'd like to thank all the people who helped me with this study. So although I'm presenting the work to you today, there's an enormous amount of people who are actually carrying out this work. With that, I will finish and thank you for your attention.